Greetings again in Jesus' name. In this video, I want to discuss a matter that we've touched on in many of our other videos about repentance, specifically about a second repentance for a genuine Christian. But we have to come to an understanding in this presentation of what constitutes a genuine conversion. And I think that's the great divide or the crossroads where we can't come to a point of agreement with many, many people out there that still preach the receive trust message. Certainly the scriptures show us that there is a possibility of a genuine believer or follower of Christ of falling into heinous sin and losing their inheritance, losing their salvation, and the possibility of them finding a second repentance and being restored. But it's, there's many things involved here to take into consideration like I say, that we have talked about before, but never specifically as just one particular study on it. That's what I want to focus upon on here. Now first, let's set a premise of understanding to begin with. I'm of the opinion that as long as a person is breathing and alive in the body, they have a chance to repent. Now whether they've been saved to begin with or never saved to begin with, they've never really had the fruit of salvation in their life or not, there's still a possibility that they can turn from their sin and, and uh, repent and come to, come to a, a real clean relationship with God if they'll turn from their sin. See, the rebellion must cease. And the fact that it talks about in Hebrews chapter 6 about it's impossible to restore them again to repentance. And understand, and we'll touch on this again, but understand he's talking about a great difficulty there. It'd be better to say virtually impossible. That same word impossible in that passage is talking about in Romans 15, 1, is weak or infirmed. You know, some, something that's, that's very, very difficult, yeah. And that's what, we'll, that's what we'll get into here. But I feel it's necessary to understand, just like, like, like in the, uh, the Peter scripture, in 2 Peter chapter 2, where he talks about this very thing. In verses 20 and 21, he says, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, you know, the corruption that's in the world through lust, through the knowledge, that's the precise and correct knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they again entangled in them and overcome, see, the latter is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn from the holy commandment that was delivered to them. So he's talking about a people in this, if you start in verse 18, he's talking about that have clean escaped, as it says in the King James Version, which is escaped indeed. The same as Jesus said, he who the Son sets free is free indeed from sin. So that's the purpose of redemption. And that's what I'm see that many of the street preachers and the fundamentalists out there that think they're preaching sound doctrine do not understand the once and for all cleansing and purging that happens in repentance. So they still preach this message based on, yeah, the sin must stop. There must be a cessation of sin, but yet when you sin, again, they give them the easy 1 John 1, 9 escape as though they can pick up where they left off, plead Jesus as their advocate with the Father, and then move on. Because in their mind, you, 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 ne you really never stop entirely. You know, you die out gradually to your lust of the flesh, continually uh, try to win over your addictions with the power of the Lord. See, they'll say you're empowered by God, but then you keep sinning. They'll say you're righteous, but you're still defiled. But so they try to win out gradually over these uh, lusts of the flesh through a process of sanctification where inevitably, and they'll often fall into the same old sins, but they always have 1 John 1, 9 to fall back on. See, they're told that the sin must stop. And, and the problem here is there's no distinction made between sins unto death and sins not unto death. You see, there's no distinction made between the first... Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, the Galatians 9, uh, 5, 19 through 21 sins. And the sins not unto death, like 1 John 5, 16 talks about, like maybe a, a fleeting thought or a mistake, a stumbling. See, they'll call all sins mistakes. Any, any sin that you commit is just a mistake, and you got 1 John 1, 9 to fall back on. So therefore, you don't have an understanding of what we're talking about here about somebody that's clean escape. Many, many have never escaped indeed 
from those that live in error. They've never escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust, like Peter's talking about in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 18 uh, th through 20, as we read. See, they've never escaped indeed. There's, in other words, there's never been a cessation of sin in their lives. So really, it's moot to discuss second repentance in that sense because, again, we cannot come to an understanding of what constitutes real Christianity. So you tell them, well, you've got to do your first works again. Well, they never did their first works to begin with in a cessation of sin. You see what I mean? A real Christian, sin's not a foregone conclusion after they've come through a real repentance. They've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They've put to death the old man with his deeds in repentance. They've done their part in repentance. So they're washed, renewed, regenerated renovated their entire character. They're partakers of the divine nature, purged by the blood, and they're walking pure, upright, and obeying Christ. Sin's not a foregone conclusion in their life. So these people say, well, yeah, everybody sins willfully, because they never make any distinction between sin. So they can't deal with the scriptures in Hebrews 10, where it says, if you sin willfully after you received the knowledge of the truth, there no sacrifice remains. Well, then they teach, well, that's the animal sacrifices. Well, that's, that's the Jews returning to animal sacrifice. Well, the text has nothing to indicate that whatsoever. It's just talking about a worser punishment on those that would trample the blood and insult the spirit of grace, willfully and deliberately choose to sin, not mistakes because due to imperfect knowledge or ignorance. No, these are willful, deliberate sins, insulting and trampling the blood. Even, even though they're not sanctified by the blood, because I don't see any fruit of salvation in a person's life that's sin, repent, sin, repent, the revolving door of using 1 John 1, 9 all the time. I don't, I don't see any fruit of salvation there. But the principle remains. The principle of trampling the blood and insulting the spirit of grace in holding him to uh, crucifying him afresh and holding to an open shame like Hebrews 6 talks about. And that brings us to the, an impossibility of a, even a first repentance. Because why? Because sin hardens the heart. Back to Hebrews 12, where Esau, beware the bitter root of sin, it bring, springs up, you know, it springs up in the heart, defiles many. It chokes out anything the word could have done, the implanted word that's able to save your soul. It chokes it out, and then they go into sin. And then he goes into what, what Esau, a profane man, who sold his birthright for a bowl of portage. Well, that's the same thing. See, they're selling their birthright, their salvation, that they think they have by just mere confession, by... First John 1 John 1.9, but they're forfeited that because of this bitter root of sin that hasn't been put to death. That's what has to happen in true redemption. When you're washed, renewed, and regenerated in the Spirit, after you've come through repentance, then that bitter root of sin is destroyed, and you've returned to obedience and uprightness and righteousness. Well, with all this discussion about there's nobody righteous, and if I say I have no sin, and nobody's perfect, and it's not of works, and on and on and on, well, you have all this confusion about, well, who is a Christian? Well, see, again, a Christian, a person walking in Christ, is what we just said, a person washed, renewed, and regenerated in Christ, purged by the blood, set free from his old passions and desires because they were crucified. See, what they do is they preach a holiness message. Many of these street preachers and evangelists, it's a holiness message that's wearing a veil of frailty in which sin's always the foregone conclusion, but the rhetoric is duty-bound. See, they'll always stress duty. They'll always stress duty, cessation of sin, but yet it's always wearing that veil of frail, frailty, of human frailty. You're going to fail. You're going to sin. You're going to sin willfully. They'll even say, I've heard them say in their video, well, everybody sins willfully. So 10, Hebrews 10.26 can't be talking about it because huh? everybody sins willfully. Well, see, if you make no distinction about what, it, what type of sin we're talking about here, well then, yeah. Sin's the foregone conclusion of somebody that's never been cleansed of their sins, never been set free from their sins. See, and that's what's happened here. The rhetoric is always duty-bound. It's based on gratitude and trust instead of a once-and-for-all cleansing. They establish it on the foundation of a theology that's underpinned by substitution, where the death of Christ is viewed as balancing the scales of justice, so to speak, 
upholding God's moral government and thereby granting the sinner forgiveness, not because he came clean in repentance, as demanded in the scriptures, but because he trusts in this conceptual exchange that took place on the cross. Not necessarily a payment for sin. A lot of the street evangelists in the, out there on the streets, they don't preach penal substitution. Some do, but many of them don't. So it's not necessarily a, a payment of sin, but it's still a satisfaction that replaces our sets aside, let's say, the necessity of the sinner crucifying their evil passions and desires in repentance, actually ceasing from his rebellion in his self-indulgence once and for all in repentance. You know, thereby entering into a covenant with God by the blood and the mercy remitting the past sins at the, at the mercy seat and the bondage to sin is broken. So there, they have clean escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust and become partakers of the divine nature and walk in newness of life. But see, the satisfaction model, as we keep talking about here, and we've stressed so many times, is this trusting in receiving no transformation takes place. The bitter root of sin remains. Why? Because the axe was never laid to it. They never stress the axe laid to the root of sin. You say, repent, stop sinning, but not how it's done. The cessation of sin takes place in the crucifying of the flesh in this season of godly sorrow and brokenness. Not gradually. You don't get forgiven and remitted and filled with the Holy Spirit and then you stop sinning. It doesn't work that way. See, but then you call it a work salvation. No, it's a salvation where you come in by the blood to remit your past sins, but you do your part in repentance that you're called to do. So see, it's a moral influence that's implied in the satisfaction, but not a genuine release from bondage. That hasn't occurred. So the purpose of Christ's death in his shed blood to work this authentic once and for all purging and cleansing within the soul of man at, at the initial repentance is frustrated by this imaginary judicial exchange of moral government, even if you minus the wrath angle like the churches preach, it negates the need for heart purity and never deals with the severity of continuing in sin. And that's the key here. The continuing in sin aspect of the second repentance. Now, we get to the meat of the study. The meat of the study. See, the latter end is worse than the beginning. Why would that be? Well, a person in this state, walking has been washed, renewed, regenerated, partakers of the divine nature, escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust, has tasted the power of God, the ages to come. All those things, the heavenly gift that the scripture talks about. Then you trample it and you return to your vomit. Well, then the worst is, it's worse than the, than the beginning. When you came out of your sins initially. Well, why is that? Because you've sinned against a precise and correct knowledge of the truth, forfeited what you, what you had come to through the blood, and now you're trying, you have to re-crucify him again. That's why it says it's impossible to restore them again to repentance. They're crucifying for themselves, you know, holding them up to open shame. You're crucifying him afresh. That's why it says that in Hebrews 6, because that's exactly what has occurred here. How is it if they've Return to their vomit, are they going to be motivated then to return to a repentance? It's like he talks about in the Revelation scriptures where he says, you know, remember therefore from where ye have fallen and do your first works, lest I come to you quickly and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now see, the option of repentance is always there. So there is a possibility of restoration, but it's not as easy as 1 John 1.9 in the advocate with the father. See, the advocate with the father anyway is the paraclete. That's the only place it's translated advocate because they're talking about they're, the idea of a judicial transaction that took place and Jesus being your lawyer, pleading your case before the father that the blood has you covered so you can pick up where you left off and repent for the rest of your life. Well, again, that's not the Christian life. Sin doesn't gradually just die out. You don't die daily to sin. Die daily in the Corinthian scriptures talking about dying daily to the afflictions of this world and the 
and the, the fact that they were being pursued unto death. So if you look at, look at it this way, you repent for the rest of your life, you sin in less, but you're gradually dying. You feel sorry when you sin in, you know, out there in the world. They don't even feel sorry. They just go headlong into it. Well, yeah, that may be the case, but what about you trampling the blood? You say you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, but yet you still live in sin. You still use in 1 John 1, 9 as your back, back door, revolving door of sin. And hoping that, well, you'll be on the confessed side or be on the right track when, on the, when the day you're called. Well, who knows when the warrant of death is sent out against them, like the, the parable of the rich man building bigger barns. Which is said, tonight thy soul is required of you. You don't know when the warrant of death is sent out against you. When, it's, when your soul is going to be required of you. So this business of stepping in and out of the light, or this one side of the line or the other, is a fallacy. And it's a dangerous fallacy being perpetrated out there on the streets by the evangelist preachers almost all over the world that we've found, especially here in the United States where uh, you be, street preaching has become a, a celebrity issue. And they all preach the same idea. They don't teach the once and for all cleansing of sin. Many of them are in the filthy rags, desperately wicked. Romans 7, uh, chief of sinners, that, all that nonsense. Sin daily in thought, word, and deed. Many of them preach penal substitution. Some of them are outright Calvinists. So the message is skewed into this moral government that I alluded to. If some kind of a satisfaction took place that you trust in and receive apart from you coming clean, that becomes a secondary issue. And that's why you got this gradual dying out to sin. So why, in the sense of under, understanding a second repentance, I think I've set the premise as best I can possibly do, which I try to do in all my, all my lessons and videos. See, if a person that's never had a cessation of sin, they've never been set free, they've never been pure at heart, they've always been fallen back and like the prodigal, I've been the prodigal son many, many times. No, the prodigal son was the only prodigal son one time. Then he came to himself, come out of the pig pen and went back to the father. Gee, that's what you have to do. That's the initial salvation. So that would require then a first repentance. That would require a coming to yourself, realizing that you have to do your part. There is a part for you to do, or workers together with God. It's like he talks about, be ye reconciled unto God in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, in the last verses of chapter 5. And then the very next thing it says, we are workers together with him that we receive not the grace of God in vain. Unless that synergy, that working together with God comes into play in reconciliation, which just means a return to favor, then there's not going to be a return to favor. Because it's repentance for remission. Not remission and then repentance, like it's being taught. Our repentance not even discussed by many of them today. So that's the premise that we're looking at here. Now, can the real Christian that has ceased from sin would be disqualified if they do commit sins in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, or Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Those are sins of disqualification. How many times you got to commit fornication and drunkenness or murder? Well, it only took one sin in the garden. They disobeyed God. They were disqualified. The same thing with anyone that would be in that situation. Now, if sin's a foregone conclusion in your mind, you've never ceased from it, you've never come clean with God, you'll never understand what I'm saying. You'll say, well, how can anybody be saved? Well, yeah, how can anybody be saved? Well, because... The real salvation is a cessation of sin and a cleansing that puts you on right footing with God and keeps you there. Doesn't the grace of God empower you? you say you're empo they say they're empowered by the Spirit, but yet they still live in sin. But the grace of God that has appeared to mankind that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So if man's body is corrupted with sin and his nature is corrupted with sin and he's got inherited sin and he's born corrupt and all this nonsense that they teach 
Well, then how can you repent of a nature? You can't repent of a nature, but you can repent of choices that you've made. So the real Christian is not routinely succumbing to temptation. They're overcoming it. Because faith worked by love purifies the heart of sin through obedience to the truth, through the Spirit, has victory over sin, the flesh, and the devil. That's real faith, as we've stressed time and time again. So they're not routinely succumbing to these things. But there is instances of people falling into the vile sins. Now let me say this, I've seen people that I've seen the fruit of salvation in their life. I've seen the power of God at work in their lives personally, and I've seen them turn their backs on God like Demas. And they've not ever come back. It's like lights out. It, it's a scary thing. I, I've seen it eye to eye. But on the other hand, there have been testimonies of people that have fallen into vile sins and have come back, have come to a, a, a repentance. But it wasn't an easy thing. And that's what I'm trying to put, put forth to your mind here. It's not going to be some simple confession. And it wasn't that with David. David being the perfect example of falling into very, very horrible sin, adultery and murder, covering it up for a long, long time while Bathsheba was pregnant, and then finally being confronted by Nathan the prophet, and then it, he's exposed. So he throws himself before the mercy of God, goes through a long season of godly sorrow, this was a brokenness. See, there's very few Davids. See, everybody thinks in this 1 John 1, 9 camp, in these evangelists and street preachers, that everybody's in that camp, that they do that stuff all the time. That's just not the case. It happened one time in David's life. He was a man after God's own heart. He's a pattern of obedience in his life, like Abraham. But he fell severely one time, showing us that that is possible for someone even... even of that stature to fall and return to their vomit, like it talks about in that Second Peter uh, chapter two scripture, a dog returning to his vomit. So it's not guaranteed that you can come back. He was restored, and he stands in contrast to Saul. Right? You got David and Saul, Peter and Judas, which we'll discuss in a minute. Saul, on the other hand, was never a man after God's own heart. He was always obstinate and rebellious in his heart, obeyed God for a while, but then when he had the honor and the prestige, notoriety of being king, then he disobeyed God at the most critical moment when God told him exactly what to do and he didn't do it. You know, the scripture in Samuel there, where it's obeyed is better than sacrifice. But then he, would, he turned his back on God. To him, there was not a restoration why? Well, because of the pattern in his life of being that disobedient. He hardened his heart against God, and he suffered the judgment thereof. So he stands in contrast, as Judas does to Peter. Well, what happened to Peter? See, first of all, you know, Peter, again, his life wasn't a pattern of, pattern of sin. It was a pattern of obedience and devotion to, God, to Christ while he was following him. Sure, there was a lot of things he didn't understand at the time. But then when the, the big temptation came and he even struck the high, ser high servant's, uh, uh, s the servant's ear and the Lord still was taken, taken by the sinners, he stumbled, he stumbled into denial. Well, see, it wasn't something that was planned. It wasn't something that it was a spur of the moment sin that he stumbled in. Sure, it was still sin. I'm not trying to lessen the severity of the sin. Certainly, he had to be restored to repentance, just like Jesus said in, in that Luke 22 scripture that many people get wrong because they use the King James Version where he talks about, he says he'll uh, pray for Peter that when he is tempted, you know, Satan wants to sift him, but he'll pray that his faith will be upheld and when he's converted, then feed my sheep. Well, the word converted in that scripture is return to me used several other places in the scripture. You can check it out if you like. So when you return to me, now Peter was converted. Peter was following Christ. He was in Christ. Certainly, he was right next to him. So he fell from that position when you return to me. So on the other hand, Judas, Judas's sin, much like Saul, it was something that he planned out. It just like Dead James Scripture talks about, when, it says the, the, when the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and the sin is full grown, it brings forth death. 
He says, yeah, when the does I see you're tempted and you're drawn away by your own desires and taken captive or enticed. See, the word, mean, the word enticed means taken captive. So he was taken captive by his lot, by his greed, long before the Last Supper there. So in his case, this was something, the bitter root of sin springing up, defiling his heart, and then he couldn't find a repentance. Although he was sorrowful for what he did, like many of the people out there on the street, they may be sorrowful for their drunkenness, their fornications, their lust, and their pornography, and all the rest of it, but there's not a godly sorrow that restores them to an obedient and pure heart before God. And that was the way with Judas. So he was destroyed by that sin, killed himself, even though he throwed the money down, the 30 pieces of silver, the blood money. But he couldn't find that redemption because his heart was defiled in sin. And that's the problem here. That's, that's the great difficulty of falling into this as a real Christian. It's not a mistake. See, it's not a mistake to stumble into porn or pornography or drunkenness or adultery or filthy behavior. It doesn't happen by accident. Again, back to that scripture in James. You need to, you need to memorize, understand that clearly. You're drawn away and enticed. So you're drawn away by your own, what, lusts. Not by, see, sin's not born in you. It gives birth to sin. See, the sinful choice in your mind you contemplated, not a fleeting thought, not a temptation. Temptation's not sin. A fleeting thought that crosses your mind is not sin. But see, when you're taken captive, see, enticed by it, taken captive, then the sin becomes very, very dangerous indeed to bitter roots springing up, defiling you, and then it brings forth that death. And then what's the last thing he said? Be not deceived, my beloved brethren. This is what happens to you. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then when the desire is conceived in the mind, it gives birth to the sin. Sin's not birth. It's not you don't born in sin. And then the sin, when it's full grown, brings death. In other words, the sin took you captive, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, like David's case, like Judas's case. Then it brought forth death, separation from God, and requires then that season of godly sorrow, that second repentance. That is possible, but very, very difficult, because why? You've sinned against a precise and correct knowledge of the truth. You've trampled the blood. You've insulted the spirit of grace. You've trampled Christ underfoot. You've crucified him again afresh. But see, if this has occurred in your life, I don't want to scare you to death if you're coming to the light, because I get many emails from people that are in this condition. Just understand that what's happened to you in the past, if you received Jesus when you was a little kid in a Sunday school class, or you rededicated your life when you was a teenager, you lived for God a couple of years after you got married, and then a divorce hit, and all this mess, and now you're in this horrible condition. Whether you was ever saved to begin with is a moot point. The point is, there has to be a fresh start with Christ in a repentance. So whether it's a first or a second repentance, it's still going to require that bitter season of godly sorrow and brokenness of you emptying yourself of all guile and deceit and coming before God in that condition. The rebellion must cease. You must be empty before the Spirit's going to come in you know, or before remission will take place. So understand that. So understand the difference here there was churches in Revelation were, were as I alluded to in Revelation 2.5 in the beginning scripture. And by the way, this, this entire study, if you want to really dwell into it, is going to be is posted up on the website. Or if you want to email me and, and I, I can send you the document, which, whichever you would like. If you want to dwell into this study is more deeply than we have in 30 or 35 minutes in our video. But the churches in Revelation were all told to repent. Yeah, repent or the lampstand is going to be removed. Repent or you're going to be blotted out of the book of life. You're going to be spewed out of the mouth of God. So again, those people's sins weren't hidden from God. There was no magic cover. There was no 1 John 1, 9 talked about in those scriptures. It was the severity of their sin, five out of the seven churches, told to repent or perish. Now, were they ever saved to begin with? Well, there was probably both. There was probably people that were, that were genuinely saved, like the man in 1 Corinthians 5, in 5, 5. 
Now, Paul alludes in that 1 Corinthians 5, a man called a brother that would do such a thing as the ho horrible fornication that he was involved in. But either way, as I just said, if you're involved in that situation yourself, just like I just alluded to, the same thing with that man in 1 Corinthians 5. Now, whether he was a real brother or not, you still must purge the leaven from among you or it will defile the whole entire bunch. So that's why he said, you know, anybody named a brother that would do such a thing, don't even eat with that person. Don't fellowship with them because they have to be shamed into repentance. Now, there's a possibility if you look in 2 Corinthians, where we have in chapter, uh, I believe it's in 3 and then up to 7, talking about the restoration that took place. In chapter, chapter 7, the scripture about repentance, about the godly sorrow that work in repentance unto salvation, in the clearing and the vivant desire change and the, the vindication. In all these matters, you prove yourself to be clear or pure in these matters. So what was the matters? Well, the matters, again, like he was talking about in 1 Corinthians. So there's a possibility, of course, that that happened. There was no possibility that Demas, there's no mention of him ever coming back. Hymenaeus and Alexander in 1 Timothy 1, there's no mention of them ever coming back. The churches in Revelation, we don't know. They were told to, they were told to repent or perish. Most, most of those churches ceased to exist not long, not long in, into history afterwards. So there is that possibility of coming back. Peter was restored. But again, it wasn't, a, it wasn't something that was planned out in advance. It wasn't something that you know, you know, he deliberately and willfully, it was that spur of the moment stumbling into a, hor a horrible denial at a time of great temptation and he bitterly came back to Christ and, fo and found restoration and Christ became a great apostle. In David, of course, the rare case of coming back from a horrible sin. So there is a possibility, just quit worrying about whether you were ever saved to begin with and understand you're in sin, you still ne you need to repent and come clean. Just focus on that part of it and you'll end the trepidation of reading these scriptures in Hebrews 6 and 10. Yes, you've done those things. Yes, you've trampled the blood. You've insulted the spirit. You've done, yeah. In principle, whether you were ever sanctified by the blood or not, you've done those things. So the principle remains in either, in either portion of that scripture, whether you were a partaker of the Holy Spirit or not. So the, come to an understanding that you need to come into a real repentance. So understanding then in the conclusion here of this matter, again, there's much, much more to this study. You could probably do a, se a second video on it in this study. But I think it's a matter of you know, turn turning to the study yourself or contacting contact me. So the concluding matter of can a real Christian, you know, can you repent again is the name of the video. So a real Christian can repent and be restored, as we've, as we've shown here, as, as we've proved from the scriptures. The consequences of the sin definitely will follow them throughout the remainder of their life, depending on the seriousness of the matter, like drunkenness and fornications and stuff, wrecked marriages, children involved. It's like with David, the sword never left his house, right? His sin affected the remainder of his life. He wasn't able to build the temple that he desired to build. His son Solomon would have to build it. So it was many things taken away from him as a result of that. His son Anselm, the murder and the, the, the incest and all the things that happened were a result of him falling into that horrible sin. So the consequences are going to be there. You make the amends that you can, you, 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 know, you, you, make, you make as many wrongs right as you're able to, take the responsibility for all your actions, yes, but the consequences will always be there. Especially if you've wrecked a marriage, if you've wrecked family, you know, if you, you've caused havoc on others. So understand that. And there's always that possibility of going past the point of no return, like Esau, who's a, being the profane man. But there's still the possibility of falling into that bitter root. Remember, the bitter root of sin, sin hardens the heart. It does not humble you, like evangelical so-called Reformed theology has taught for 500 years. No, sin humbles you. It, or sin, to, sin hardens you. It doesn't humble you. It hardens your heart in a bitter root. So there is that possibility, which, like I've seen, 
Even though the people, I don't think, fell into heinous sins, but just turned their back on the Lord like Demas. It doesn't mention anything about Demas falling into any horrible sin. He just turned his back on the Lord, went back to the world. That's what I've seen. So something is hardening the heart to never return again and never even want to talk about it. So again, there's a danger there. And the motivation. Where's the motivation and the incentive going to come from? That's key in understanding coming back from your fall and returning to the vomit and how dangerous it is. Where's that motivation and incentive going to originate from if you turned your back on Christ, if you've sinned willfully, if you've gone back into your heinous sins, even though you're in worldly sorrow, in horror, in trepidation in your life of that sword hanging over your head because you know the consequences of your actions, there's still that motivation that's got to come from somewhere. See, initially, it came from the godly sorrow when you heard the word. It cut you to the heart and you repented initially. But the second time, where is it, go where is it going to originate from? So again, keep that in mind in this understanding of a second repentance. So again, in the understanding of when he says impossible in that scripture, he's talking about it's very difficult, you know, translated weak in Romans 15.1 as we pointed out in the beginning. So that's what you want to take into consideration in these things and always keep forefront in your mind that you can't play with fire and not be burned, as the scripture says. That to be sober and vigilant all the time because your adversary, the devil, is walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by all your brotherhood in the world. See, it's common to man, the temptation. Temptations are always going to be there, and you're always going to have natural inclinations and desires. That's not evidence of any kind of fallen nature. There's natural inclinations and desires guided by a moral conscience to accuse or excuse indulging those things. That's the way, uh, the understanding of, na of the nature of man in the scriptures, not this moral depravity, born in sin, inherited nonsense that, again, evangelical Christianity has taught for 500 years. That's done more damage to the world than anything I could, I could even know to all the entire realms of everything, is politics, religion, media, entertainment, you name it. So if a real Christian falls into these heinous sins, returns to their vomit, there is a possibility of coming back. But on most cases, I've found that you've never really had a cessation of sin in your life. You've never really been washed, redeemed, and regenerated. You might have been sincere. You might have felt the euphoria. You had some worldly sorrow for your sins, some weeping at an altar. You was, un you was zealous for a while for God. You know, things were working out real good in your life. And, but still, examine yourself in your past life. Was there really this regeneration this once and for allness of repentance in your life. That's the thing that needs to be stressed more than anything else and understood by everyone that goes out to preach the Word of God. And it's the least understood thing that there is. So no matter you know, which you come from, these people that will not count as done, the, uh, preachings and the teachings and the theology of Arminius, Wesley, Finney, thousands of others. They will not take that horribly flawed theology and throw it on the trash heap of history. So that's why we have history repeating itself on a much larger scale than it ever did during the Reformation times because of the World Wide Web potential. So instead of an army then of firebrand evangelists of one accord pulling down the strongholds as we do in our lessons and our, our writings and the few of us, the handful of us in our little group that fellowships, instead of that, pulling them out of the bondage of sin and the strongholds they're in bondage to, we have countless divided camps that are scattering abroad, going and driven by various impulses in every direction down the next rabbit hole of delusion. And that's what scattering abroad means in the scriptures. See, the, you're gathering with me into the wheat, wheat into the barns, 
or you're scattering abroad. You know, you're driven by all various impulses, different teachings, some wild teaching about Christ's divinity, some wild teachings, these people denying Christ's divinity and denying repentance, denying on and on it goes. And the people run after these preachers and preachers, just like the scripture said they were, tickling their ears, giving them what they want to hear, always based on that sin, repent, sin, repent, receive Jesus, magic cover, substitution, theology, gospel. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. So those of us that can grasp these things, that can build a sharpened discernment and see who's is preaching this by the spirit of truth in the spirit of error. Who's mixing truth with error and who's straight on path of righteousness? That's the discernment that needs to be in a saint that's going to remain steadfast, grounded, and immovable in Christ.